Henry Hardy um, asks me to comment on a radio pro program in the UK called The Moral Maze, which recently dedicated an episode to the discussion of the conventional talking points we hear in our culture about how we should understand and how we should react to the war in Ukraine. And Henry has a special place in my life because Henry is the man who made Isaiah Berlin um, available to our culture. Isaiah Berlin is one of the great public intellectuals of the 20th century, one of the great um, essayists of the 20th century in the English language. And Henry met Isaiah, I think this year, 50 years ago, right? And via extraordinary endeavor, brilliance, persistence, patience, um, delivered us a couple of dozen books of Isaiah's essays, Isaiah's letters, and has really made Isaiah um, available to um, our culture for the long term. And moreover, what's so, uh, one of the other things that's, that's so moving about Henry is that he has never been territorial about people coming into the field, if you like. People coming in wanting to do a bit of uh, work or a bit of research on Isaiah Berlin. So long as they come with love and a degree of professionalism, whether they share Henry's views of Isaiah, they're always supporting, always welcome. And for about 15 years, Henry has been uh, s supportive of my commitment to introduce something into our culture to do with Isaiah Berlin. Um, and in particular supportive of the fact that I'm trying to do this um, as I um, still endure, although partly come out of a process of very serious illness. So, Henry, um, I'm really deeply grateful. And let's get to your question like this. Um, I'm going to lay a couple of foundations about what I think is going on with the war. Just take a minute to do over that. Then I'll go through a few things that I picked out in the program and I've just listened to it. Um, but finally, let's let's make this the heart of this chat. Um, it's always appropriate to, to stop and ask, well, what would Isaiah Berlin have said about this if he were here? So that's how I want to end uh, this conversation, by just wondering what Isaiah would have told us about this war. So let's do a bit of basic grounding. Number one, the Kremlin is engaged in a pattern of escalation with Ukraine being just one frontier of it. This is not a conflict between two ex-Soviet states, a big bully and an innocent victim. This is a process of escalation and Ukraine is just one chapter. The second thing to say is that that process, that pattern of escalation, doesn't have a pre-designated set of targets or um, uh, goals, um, except the goal of just disturbing the seabed and seeing what happens. So the Kremlin is not reaching for three or four starfish they want to pick from the bottom of the sea. The Kremlin is disturbing the seabed and hoping some interesting things happen next to which it can react and uh, which it can use to its advantage. And the third thing to say, perhaps, is that reformatting the regime um, and making the regime more sustainable is a central aim of the war. You can't understand this war unless you understand it as a gambit in domestic policy. And so if, if that's the grounding, what are the kind of signposts in terms of which Putin is thinking? I think the first signpost is um, progress in eastern Ukraine. Second signpost is taking control over all of Ukraine, which is a central aim for Putin, will remain so. And his confidence about doing that is increasing. And that doesn't mean conquering Kiev. It means bringing it about that perhaps within a year or two, this um, let us say if the war is going on still, there's a, a party of peace in Ukraine that's willing to negotiate with Moscow, willing to make more concessions, willing to indulge, um, and that therefore Moscow can gain some control over how Ukraine is run. And then the third signpost is 
to put it bluntly, the destruction of NATO, and to put it more softly, just um, the aspiration to witness, if not cause, um, further divisions uh, and um, disagreements uh, within Europe and within the West that make the West less effective at acting coherently. Um, but the bigger goal might be to bring it about that NATO is um, no longer an effective alliance. And one way to do that is by challenging Article 5, and there is the conviction in the Kremlin that NATO would not respond um, as per what it says on the page if Russia invaded a NATO country in the Baltics. So that's a bit of the grounding as I see it. Let's jump into the conversation um, as it happened on the Moral Maze. The first guest, we don't need to know who these people are because these are literally things that get said ad infinitum in our culture and you, you would have come across them um, completely independently of this program or guests on this program. So um, the first person on was a Paul Ingram from the Center for the Study of Existential Risk from Cambridge. And he said that, look, um, it's uh, our moral obligation to avoid nuclear conflict. Yeah, I agree with that. But then he said that um, what happened has been created by actions we took and um, that largely was also, of course, the expansion of NATO, which was a very serious mistake. Um, that's bullshit. Um, and I came across a couple of funny tweets about this recently. I might, I might put them up, you know, that uh, pro-Putin Russians are telling Europeans, you know, we're going to come after you. Anti-Putin Russians are telling Europeans, well, they're going to come after you. And Europeans are saying, OK, let's negotiate. Um, so NATO expansion is not nothing. And it's a factor, but it's not the central factor, as we've discussed on many, many occasions. It's not the central factor um, uh, involved in the causation of this war, contrary to what uh, people like John Mearsheimer say. So that I reject um, vehemently. And the best way to uh, make the point emphatically is just to look at the language of the Russian regime itself, which is completely incompatible with the idea that they're just worried about NATO expansion. Um, second guest was a um, uh, Ukrainian research fellow from Chatham House. And when she was speaking, question got raised, which is important. Is Ukraine protecting Europe or is Europe protecting Ukraine? And I think what's really important at the moment is that Europe is divided about what Europe is. Is Poland Europe? Well, yeah, but is Poland as much Europe as Germany and France? So if Poland is saying, well, these Russians are a direct and existential threat to us, does that mean the Russians are a direct and existential threat to Europe? Or is this a Polish problem, a problem for the Baltic states, but not a problem for all of Europe? So this is a very important conversation about which Europe is divided and it's not going to respond adequately to this crisis until it gets further down the line of having this conversation with itself. And at the moment, I am moderately pessimistic about that. Um, the person who stole the show was Richard Sakwa, who um, spoke an unbelievable amount of nonsense literally to the point that almost for reasons of just uh, taking oneself intellectually seriously, he'd be interrupted if he came up with that sort of stuff at dinner by anybody who really, um, in an up-to-date way, was connected with the conflict and with the, with the region, despite the fact that he is professor of Russian and European politics. Um, and what Richard said is that this has been long in the making and predictable and avoidable and that Putin is uh, responsible for pulling the trigger, but we made the gun, we, the West, um, that we need a ceasefire and stop piling weapons into Ukraine. 
and that there is no evidence whatsoever that Putin wanted regime change. This is false. Um, and that the denazification project um, really amounted to an aspiration by the Russians to rebalance repression of Russian folks and Russian, Russian language in Ukraine rather than fundamentally do anything more ghastly. I mean, the denazification story, you've got to understand, has run not just in terms of what the Russians have been doing in Ukraine, but it's also run locally in Russia. That uh, There's been this story about separating out the good Russians from the bad Russians and getting rid of the bad Russians who don't support the regime properly. Um, the denazification story has been substantively genocidal. I mean, that's pretty clear. And that's causally part of why the Russian soldiers behaved so badly. It's not the only part. The other parts are that these soldiers come from these extraordinarily um, desolate towns, um, which are economic and cultural slums. That there isn't a clear mission. The Russian soldier in Ukraine does not know what they're really doing there. And um, nevertheless, this, this denazification story probably was the single biggest factor in why the soldiers behaved as they did. They really were distinguishing proper from improper Ukrainians. And really, an improper Ukrainian, it seems like, is really any kind of Ukrainian who isn't Russian. So. I'm not objecting here, I'm just giving a score out of 10, and I'm giving a sort of zero negative scores to Richard Sackwin here. Um, and I suppose the, the one distinction that can help people here is that um, NATO is an existential threat to Russia. If you conceive of Russia as an expansive colonial power, which is how Putin conceives of it. And Putin can't conceive of Russia in any other way. And so you can actually understand how for him um, there is an element of existential threat there. But even for Putin now, that's not the central cause. That's not the central story. But if you think of Russia as a sovereign country, would NATO then be a threat to it? We've got to not bullshit ourselves here. Look, it's not quite right to say that NATO is just a defensive alliance. And if Russia were a democracy with a legitimate government and Russia weren't a member of NATO, NATO wouldn't be an existential threat to Russia, but NATO would be a security concern for Russia. That's how it balanced out. But basically, uh, Henry, I'm dismissing everything that Richard Sacco said, according to my understanding of the situation. Um, Edward Lucas was last... He's a British writer and security specialist, and he probably came closest to my view on balance, because um, I think it's correct to be hawkish on this. Um, and he said that Russia wants an end to NATO and that Russia has to stop being an empire. And so this is what I think um, um, I would say at... Um, um, at this point, that we've got to balance the idea of unconstructive escalation with properly supporting Ukraine. That sometimes the two are not in conflict. So, for example, it's possible to tell the Ukrainians, look, if we give you this, can you use these weapons? We give you these weapons. Can you use them in that and this particular way, but not in this other way? Um, so it's completely possible to say we aren't giving Ukraine enough weapons fast enough, but at the same time to say, well, yes, we are cautious about Ukraine um, escalating the extent to which they're firing on Russian territory, for example. On most issues like that, not Ukrainian public opinion, but the Ukrainian government has been relatively balanced. I mean, they're very conservative about firing on Russian territory. They know that can, that can trigger uh, mobilization in Russia, and they know that can trigger the end of Ukraine. So, um, you know, there are some ways in which pumping up Ukraine more while being worried about a, a dangerous escalation, th th they are two things you can simultaneously achieve, and you've got to keep exploring how much we can do both and on this.
So with conversations like that, it's customary to say, look, what would Isaiah Berlin have said if we could bring him into the room? What would he have told us about this war? So let's give this a little bit of a go. I think the first thing that he would say might be that, look, evil hasn't gone away from the world. Evil is part of reality. All that's happened is that perhaps since what happened in the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s, evil on this sort of scale has been on a temporary holiday from Europe. Now it's back. But it didn't really go anywhere. So that's Isaiah telling us, look, you might still be, because we to some extent still all are, in the grip of a teleological way of thinking about historical progress. But our belief in that really has broken down to a good extent, and we should admit that. And admitting that means that we are horrified by what the Russians are up to, but we're perhaps not scandalized by it because it's not some kind of extraordinary aberration in, you know, your reality just breaking up. No, it's to some extent just the case of Nicholas I, Tsar Nicholas I, who is Iberlin wrote about, but with nuclear weapons. So the benefit of that is if our sense of reality isn't shaken by this, what it'll allow us to do is pay closer attention to our own societies, to our, our own democracies, and how not to be, you know, unaware and unconstructive about their fragilities, which we need to face and fix. Now, I think a second thing that Berlin would say well, would be that this whole business of Ruski Mir, this whole business of Russian world, of Russia's special Eurasian cultural identity is bollocks. Um, a great colleague and friend of Isaiah Berlin's, the beautiful philosopher Richard Volheim, used to say about philosophical positions that couldn't get off the ground that they were unavailable. And Richard would often say, well, that and this is unavailable to you, no matter how much you might want it. And Isaiah would say, look, that story is unavailable. In other words, there's just not going to be a way of coherently putting it together. It's just a geographical classification that stops making sense once you begin to take seriously what you might actually put inside it. And one of the central reasons that's so is that you can't put together a picture of Russian identity that is fundamentally a rejection of European values and European traditions. You just can't do it. In other words, Russia taking a stance that's deeply, radically oppositional to Europe is either going to be a frictionless position for Russia to take or if it's a position of some substance, it's going to be just one moment of historical moment that Europe is going through. And it's going to be a kind of um, chapter of European autocritique, you know, that one bit of Europe is criticizing another bit of Europe. And that's um, very well expressed if you pay close attention in this narrative that you constantly see coming out of not just the Kremlin, but the slightly wider network of sort of circles around the Kremlin, which says we are the true Europeans. Because what's happened is that European conservatism has died a kind of horrendous death. We've got all of this stuff that Jordan Peterson is complaining about. And that's, that's a cultural catastrophe for Europe, these people in Putin's elite say. And what we are is in part, at least, the true, you know, carriers of the baton of genuine European conservatism. And when you ask them to fill out that conservatism, there is nothing there. 
It's nothing particularly conservative, nothing particularly European there. So that's hot air. And it's important to recognize that as this sort of expression of the problem that there isn't a way for Russia to define itself away from Europe except by turning and using European resources on the way to doing that. I think there is something else that I, Isaiah would tell the Russians off about. And that's that if you look at the sort of utterly primitive but slightly more sophisticated advocates of Ruski Mir, like Alexander Dugin, the philosopher who is either a fan of Putin, depending on the mood, or a critic of Putin from the even more reactionary side. Um, what they say is, look, no, there isn't a set of usable cultural materials that Russia has that it can rely on to distinguish itself against Europe. So what we need to do is create them. And in a recent interview um, with Russia's leading propagandist, Dugin was asked, look, what is this Russian identity? And Dugin's answer was, well, we've got to beat up Ukraine, uh, maybe conquer Belarus and Ukraine together, and then we can begin constructing it. So, obviously, that's a highly embarrassing thing to say for a pop philosopher, even for a pop philosopher, because it's an elementary misunderstanding of the relationship between reflection and practice. There is a, a beautiful uh, line in a book by the wonderful philosopher Charles Taylor called Sources of the Self, which is Charles Taylor's second best book, which he wrote in 1989. He wrote an even better book called Secular Age in 2004. And there's a line in that 89 book, which says that the causal arrow between practice and reflection on practice goes in both directions. In other words, what happens is that there are certain things swimming about in the culture, various kinds of currents and moments of cultural moment coming and going. Then uh, thinker and intellectual community, set of intellectual communities would pick that up, do something with it, for example, systematize it, intensify it, distort it in some way, then spit it back out into the culture, and then perhaps reabsorb it again. Some other groups might reabsorb it again, do some intellectual stuff with it, spit it back out into the culture. So you can't just, as it were, jump as high as you can on the spot and create ideas that are going to be usable to your culture. So it's a kind of act of clowning really by Dugin and the two or three other people who are doing what he's doing because there's nothing behind them. Um, there isn't a culture behind them um, and there isn't even an intellectual culture behind them. There's just a small number of people and so that's just not how a culture talks to itself. That's just not how this works. It takes a lot and of course if you uh, engage with some of Isaiah Berlin's public lectures and essays on 19th century Russia, you're going to see this process of political reflection, spiritual cultural reflection on Russia's identity going on through the 19th century, which is what Isaiah mainly talks about. And what you really find is that if, if you were to take a... Um, a kind of a Google Earth view of Russia and Russia's conversation with itself about what it is politically, what it is in terms of its place in history, let's say. You're going to find that, let us say, in the 1830s, in the 1840s, you see a few little tiny disconnected threads here and there, but uh, it's 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 mostly just little tiny pieces, bits and pieces and dots and not much more. That's it. Um, only decades later, by the 1860s, 
um, do you get a sort of bigger coloring in of the, coloring in of that map that there's really the sense that there's more of a cultural life and intellectual life and ideas bouncing about floating around um, and so again w without a background like that um, there's something farcical about Dugan saying we need to now invent and construct Russian identity well <laughs> cultural identities don't get constructed by four people uh, talking um, on YouTube um, or writing 10 books a year or whatever. Dugan has this prolific tendency to um, r release so, so much um, uh, rhetorical gas in, in print that the, the quantities themselves suggest that the stuff can't be, can't be good. Now, I think something else Berlin wouldn't fail to notice is that um, it's extraordinary for intellectuals to propose that the foundation for this new cultural exploration should be militarism and conquest. And it's extraordinary that Dugan genuinely says, and he isn't alone, and there are people around Putin with thoughts like this, that Russia can't begin a proper conversation with itself unless it is appropriately geographically unconstrained. Seriously. So Dugan genuinely thinks that unless you conquer um, Belarus and Ukraine, Russia doesn't have enough Lebensraum to um, adequately address the cultural challenges it faces. And of course, what's so highly embarrassing about this is that these I expansionist ideas, certainly in Dugan, are derived from Europe too, from um, a kind of mishmash of European scientism and European distortion of capital R romantic ideas and these two elements intertwining in the um, unloveliest episodes of the first half of the 20th century. I think the final thing that I would say, that as I might tell us, you might tell us 10 more, but let, we've got to give them a break. Um, five is good. Um, is that he'd evaluate nuclear risk slightly differently to how he would have evaluated it during the Cold War. And I don't know how he would put it, but roughly the cartoonish thing to say is um, how much people don't want to die and destroy the world um, in part depends on their values. Now, taken very broadly here, um, so as to include negative and destructive values so as to include various kinds of psychopathology and various kinds of cultural mechanisms that um, are um, conducive to psychopathology. Um, and I think um, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, Isaiah's um, maid asked him whether there'll be, there'd be a nuclear war. And he said, no, not at all. Um, and he had that confidence. He was deeply co connected to the US political establishment at that time. He knew lots of people, met JFK. Um, and he wouldn't be as confident, actually, now. Because what he would say is that the way and drop of a Khrushchev on anybody really in um, you know the um, Politburo would think about nuclear risk particularly strategic nuclear exchange is kind of similar really to how you know 
Joe Biden would think about it or John Major would think about it or Donald Trump would think about it or Marine Le Pen would think about it. It doesn't really matter. Bernie Sanders it doesn't matter whether you name a responsible or irresponsible, a constructive or destructive politician. They're all going to think the same roughly in Europe and in North America about that. And that's going to be roughly what Gorbachev or Andropov or Khrushchev would think. But these folks are a bit different. They are, let us say, one fifth of one quarter of the way from Khrushchev to Al Qaeda. So it's of course correct to assume that they don't want World War Three, nuclear World War Three. But it's wrong to assume that we don't have to add just an inflection there that changes the way we think about this calculation with these people. I'm going to say a bit more about that, I think, in a future nuclear risk video. And that might not come for a while because nuclear risk at the moment, it seems to me, is genuinely lower than it was a few months ago when we made a couple of videos about it on the main channel. This will almost inevitably and sadly change, and then we might talk about it again. So thank you so much for listening to this conversation. My um, hope is that latest next Sunday we're going to have a video on the main uh, channel. And my ambition is to have two videos a month on the main channel. And I've been falling short of that recently for health reasons. Um, but I keep exploring ways of making the schedule I um, uh, uh, aspire to more possible. Uh, peace and light to you all. Talk soon.